All right. So the week, your midterms week, we won't be covering new material other than maybe the Monday of that week. You might have to, we might be finishing up um, some topics, but the way that my, my tests always work is I'll give you a practice test um, the week, one week before the test. And that will be your, your assignment for over the weekend. That'll be your, instead of having the quiz, you'll have a practice test that you're working on. It'll be a homework assignment. You turn in for points. And then the test will be the exact same format. So all that'll be different, it'll be different compounds or different, um, different numbers in the calculations and things like that. But it'll be the same exact structure. And typically what I try to do is I make, I chunk it up into 10 sections. Um, they're each worth 10 points. So every problem type is gonna be worth the same number of points as everything else. So you, you can plan around your strengths that way. Um, and we'll talk more about, about the test taking strategy and where to find the easy points, the quick points um, when we get a little bit closer. Um, but we'll, so we'll plan on, on probably either that Thursday or Friday before spring break, taking the test. Um, if you're not here that week, because I know I think at least three of you have already talked to me about missing that week before spring break. Um, what will happen is your grade that goes into the school. I don't do midterm grades, but your school requires them, I think, right? So what will happen is if you aren't able to take the test before we have to submit midterm grades, your midterm grade might not accurately represent what happens on the exam, right? Which could be a good thing or a bad thing for you, depending on how you are on tests and turning stuff in on time. Um, but regardless, that midterm grade doesn't matter to me. Um, as far as, as this class, all that hap matters in this class, as far as the college is concerned, is what happens by the end of the class. So it's no big deal that you're taking the test the week after the Monday or Tuesday when we get back from spring break. Um, just make sure that you talk to me if you're, if you're going to miss the test for spring break. Thank you. Uh, Lana, go on. they're asking you to, here, just come grab this. Um, so that's, that's the plan at this point. Next week's a normal week. Week after is midterms week. Week after that is spring break. And if you aren't able to take the test at the normal time slot, you're going to take it when we get back from spring break. Does that all sound reasonable? Okay. I really wish that I could just like petition all the dual enrollment classes to not have midterm grades because we don't do those. Our courses aren't built for those. Um, and I don't want to mess up at anybody's GPA too much, although schools aren't using that as much to determine admissions these days anyway. Um, so it's not as big of a deal, I don't think. But either way, I know it's not fun to be worried about your midterm grade when all that really matters for the class is the final grade. Um, any other any quest, scheduling questions related to that? So next Thursday is your next quiz. And following Thursday will be the midterm exam. Okay. All right. Then let's get into the, to today's lecture. We're going to finish up some ideas about the shapes of molecules. Um, and then uh, next week we're going to talk all about energy, and we'll be able to do some some good uh, a good lab. Um, how did uh, finishing up the nomenclature packet go yesterday? Is everybody, I think we probably will have a short quiz just so I can continue to, to get everybody back on schedule as far as having, um, getting into that habit. Um, since I think, I think everybody was making enough progress. Does anybody, I, I won't have anybody raise their hand or anything if you're not done. Um, but if that seems like that's gonna be too much, come talk to me after the class. Um, if you're overwhelmed by the level of work, but I think I think we're going at kind of a slow pace. I think everybody's able been able to keep up pretty well so far, right? So we will have a quiz this weekend, um, and uh, and we'll go from there. Ah, uh, good quiz questions. Someone asked about diamonds. Why are diamonds common on other planets and not on Earth? Um, there's a lot of reasons why that might be. Turns out that different minerals form under different conditions, right? Um, Earth doesn't have that much carbon in it. In fact, if you look at how much carbon is present as part of um, what they call the lithosphere, 
um, meaning just the part of the planet that's made up primarily of, of solids and rocks. Um, there really is hardly any carbon in the lithosphere. Almost all of Earth's minerals are silicon and oxygen and iron based. So there's just not that much carbon around. But on a different planet that had similar conditions or had higher pressures, higher atmospheric pressures, or was a larger planet, had more gravity, if it had more carbon present in the in the crust, then they might then diamonds would be very very common in in uh, conditions like that, and some other things would be less common. Uh, it all just has to do with the makeup of the planet and the conditions of the planet. Um, similarly, it, those these two questions might not seem like they're all that similar. What makes acids different than other molecules? Um, basically, the fact that we're water based. Everything that living on Earth is water-based, which means um, changing where those H pluses are affects how well things dissolve in water and affects the shape of certain molecules, um, especially proteins and DNA molecules and things like that in living systems. All of that means that acid molecules aren't that different than other molecules other than the fact that they're more common in living organisms. and us being living organisms, we kind of care about other living organisms um, and how all that works, which is why they kind of get their own special treatment. It's mostly just because we're water-based and um, acids are really important when it comes to determining property of water-based solutions. Um, if it was, if we were not water-based organisms, then acids may or may not be important. They might be this, you know, very, very niche topic. But because we are water-based, carbon-based organisms, um, they, they wind up being really important. Um, somebody asked about cloning. Cloning actually never, it didn't really stop getting research. It's just not that hard, turns out, anymore. Um, once it was proved, I was back in the late 90s that they cloned Dolly. The first multicellular um, organism was a, was a sheep named Dolly that was cloned. I believe named after Dolly Parton, actually. Um, but check me on that one. There's a, there's a scientist get funny with their names, um, but read up on Dolly because I think she's named after Dolly Parton. Um, it didn't stop research and cloning. They, it just wasn't that interesting once you solved the problem and we were able to do it. Um, where the interesting genetic research is happening now is trying to make sense of all of the parts of the different, of the genetic code and then doing things like genetically modifying organisms. And that is a really big issue when it comes to morals and, and the ethics of um, genetically modifying multicellular organisms. It's one thing to say, take a, um, you know, a uh, tetra, a small fish from the Amazon um, that they sell in, in pet stores and give it the gene so that it has fluorescent proteins in it. So it glows under black light. Um, that's one thing that doesn't really affect the quality of life of the fish. It's not a whole lot of ethical issues experimenting on fish. Um, you start talking about genetically modifying higher primates and people get a lot more touchy, understandably so. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of, there's sort of a voluntary moratorium when it comes to doing genetic modifications to um, mammals for the most part, especially higher level primates, um, mostly because that's, it's a little bit like nuclear research. Once that starts happening, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Um, and so there's sort of most, most scientists that work in that area and most countries have, a, have a sort of agreed upon like, Hey, we're not until this gets resolved until everybody's on the same page when it comes to the morals and the ethics of, of genetic modification in, in say humans, um, nobody's going to do it. Um, there was a guy in China who published saying that he did genetically modify a bunch of, um, not just modify, but then modif then implanted them into human uteruses. Um, but I don't think anything ever came of that. So I think either he was faking it or all of those, they, those fetuses didn't, didn't successfully implant um, because there's been no no information about that since and that was about five years ago i think i first heard about that it was a big deal in the science industry at the or the science community at the time um that said it was also in china and they are not exactly forthcoming with their research and knowledge and 
um, research in China is sort of its own beast when it comes to the whole like, morals and ethics thing. Um, so who knows exactly what's happening with that. Um, we'll, the last one we'll talk about now is the dark matter and dark energy, and we'll save the other two for next week. Um, I want to address dark matter and dark energy because we've been talking about astronomy stuff. Does anybody know what dark matter and dark energy is? They sound like they should be related, right? Um, basically, scientists just use the word dark when they're not sure what something is or what's causing it. So dark matter is just the fact that if we look at the shape of, of the Milky Way and other galaxies, we can estimate roughly how big those galaxies are in terms of mass. And their mass seems to be larger than the amount of matter we can see. We can estimate their mass based on how they move, but then we can use telescopes and spectroscopy to say, okay, well, we know all of that star cluster are all made up of this element and are about this size. So we can estimate the total mass of a galaxy and we get two different ways and they don't agree with each other. The way that the galaxies all rotate is indicating that they're much, much larger than all of the matter that we can visually see. And so dark matter is just what scientists use to say, well, there's some more matter there. There must be based on how things are rotating, but we can't see it. So we're just going to call it dark matter and we'll figure out what it is later. Um, so it's and dark energy is similar in the in the sense that it's basically energy. We don't know where it comes from but it's not related to dark matter. Dark energy is the energy that's responsible for the fact that all the galaxies in our universe are accelerating away from each other. So not only are they moving away from each other, they're moving away from each other at a growing rate. Their speed is increasing. When gravity would indicate that everything should be being drawn back together because all mass pulls on other, all other mass. Um, so, if we just looked at it in terms of gravity, we would expect everything to be being drawn back together and things slowing down, decelerating galaxies. And instead we see things getting faster. Um, and we don't know why. We don't know what the energy is that's causing that. So we call it dark energy. Um, so there, it's not so much, we can, we can see the effects of dark matter and dark energy, but we don't actually know what they are, which is why we use the word dark to describe them. As soon as we're able to explain why these things are happening, we won't call them, we'll have a better understanding and we'll probably have a better name put to them than just dark matter and dark energy. Um, but as it stands, we don't really know what they are. We can just see the influences, which is kind of interesting. Um, and the why is hex why are hexagons always used? That'll make more sense once we start talking about molecular shapes. So next week, we'll talk about that one. Um, this is just a good figure I found as a as sort of a cheat sheet flow chart for determining how to name things. Um, they're using the term molecular instead of covalent, but a molecular compound and a covalent compound means the same thing. Uh, and, and you should all know as well that um, all of these, I see, I see you frantically trying to take pictures with your phones. Um, you don't need to do that because all of these slides are, are posted as PDFs on Canvas. Just go to the current week and you can find that I have links to um, all of these slide decks as well as links to the video recordings um, are all posted on Canvas. So you can you can get it that way instead of you can also take a picture if that's easier and how you're going to remember to find it later. But um, I would recommend uh, checking out the slide decks as well, especially when you're missing class. Um, if you're going to miss class, follow along with the slide decks for any new material because that'll give you a, a hint for it. As long as you can do the example problems in the slide decks, um, then you're you're in good shape. Um, if you can't, go back and check the recording and see if you can get some help on, on what it did there. Um, is there anything else I want to talk about here? There's nothing on this slide that... I think this is pretty much exactly what we've covered as far as nomenclature goes. I think it um, even, I don't think there's anything that's different about this than what we've talked about other than the fact they use the word molecular instead of covalent. All right, so like I said, 
brute force. We're going to power through that packet on nomenclature. We're going to get all the polyatomic ions names down and charges down. Um, and we're just going to keep practicing until it's second nature. Um, because if you do well enough at the nomenclature portion on the midterm, then I might not put it on the final exam. If, as a class, we do well enough on the nomenclature part of the midterm. So get it down well, do your part, help everybody else out. Um, because I don't really, I don't really like testing y'all on nomenclature. It's boring. Um, it's just memorizing and getting up to speed, right? I'd rather not have to test you on that twice. Um, and that's always my big, my big carrot and stick too with the quizzes is if you do bad enough on one of my quizzes, I'm just going to make the whole class take it over again. Um, until the class average is where I think it should be. And that doesn't mean you get to throw out the old scores. Um, it just means that we're going to keep taking the test until I'm satisfied that you know the material. So I only really have to bring out that threat when it comes to nomenclature because nomenclature is always really tempting to be like, I'm just going to take my five out of 10 on this and move on and never think about it again. Can't do that. You need to understand how to name things. Um, for safety reasons, if nothing else, when it comes to labs. So any nomenclature questions? Anything else that came up in the packet that we hadn't seen before or that didn't jive with what we talked about? Going once, twice, moving on. All right, how do we determine whether something has ionic or covalent bonds? We talked about this before to some extent. Josie? Yeah, if you can look at it and you can in, and you can recognize, oh, this is something that if it was by itself would have a positive charge and these have negative charges or um, depending on the numbers. Um, in tippet, the easiest way to see that is metals versus non-metals. All right, although there are um, a few cases we're going to talk about this. I want to throw this idea out there. Um, after we talk about molecular shapes, we'll talk about there's a better definition for uh, ionic versus covalent. Because like I mentioned before, it's a, it's a sliding scale. Let's see. Here's the midterm practice from last quarter, ours, like I said, will be slightly different. Uh, what I'm really looking for is those electronegativity values. See if I can get this to rotate. The, the main thing that I was going to point out is we talked about what electronegativity is, right? But we haven't really. That'll work. We haven't really done anything with electronegativity values. Your midterm exam is going to have a couple pages supporting information at the end. Um, one of one page of which is a periodic table. It's going to have your equation sheet and your conversion sheet are both going to be there too. You don't have to memorize conversions, although it can be helpful just for the sake of being able to go fast um, and not have to stop to look stuff up. Uh, but the other thing that's going to be on there in uh, sort of embedded in the, the uh, periodic table is all these electronegativity values. And electronegativity values are helpful because they allow us to classify bonds more specifically than just it's a metal and a non-metal. It turns out some metals have a high enough electronegativity and some non-metals have a low enough electronegativity that they actually make covalent bonds. Does everybody remember what electronegativity was? Everybody have a definite, what was ionization energy? Who remembers that one? That's what that's how we we ranked them, right? Ionization energy is how much energy it takes to remove an electron from something. The other way of thinking about that is 
how tightly does something hold on to its electrons. Things at the top right of the periodic table hold on to their electrons really, really tightly. Turns out even when they make covalent bonds. Um, and so we actually have a, we will get to where we're using these electronegativity values to determine how ionic a bond is. Is it ionic, is it covalent, or is it kind of half and half, what we call a polar bond? Um, but I want you to, to be aware of this that concept of electronegativity, be thinking about that when we start talking about these Lewis dot structures, because that's, that's actually a better way of determining how um, how and whether these things are ionic or covalent. What would the Lewis dot structure look like for that first one? Who remembers how to do these Lewis dot structures back from all the way back on Monday? It's been a bit. Four whole days. Sort of a lot's happened since then. Carbon in the middle, why? This is the other reason why it's worth, worthwhile to come back and think about these electronegativity values is if you're not sure what to put in the middle, you go with whatever has the lowest electronegativity. If it's got a low electronegativity, it's not very good at holding on to its electrons. And so it can go in the middle because that's where you're gonna put whatever is gonna be sharing the most electrons goes in the middle. So if we're talking about carbon versus chlorine versus fluorine, these numbers are unitless. Um, they're, they're in a scale called degrees Pauling. Um, they don't, you don't really use these numbers for any calculations though. So they're electronegativity values. You don't have to worry about the units too much. Basically, all you do is you compare carbon versus fluorine versus chlorine. Carbon's got the lowest electronegativity, so it's gonna share the most. You can, the other way that I always, the other analogy I always use for electronegativity is it's like how much of a bully is the element. More electronegative means that they're worse at sharing. They're going to steal electrons from other things, from other elements. So if you've got, if you've got um, a low electronegativity surrounded by a bunch of bullies, then the bullies are all picking on the poor carbon sitting in the middle by itself. And so we're going to put carbon in the middle. And then we've got two chlorines and two fluorines. How many, how many electrons do we have to work with here? Valence electrons. How many valence electrons does fluorine have? Seven. How many valence electrons does chlorine have? Also seven, right? How many valence electrons for carbon? Four. So we have 32 electrons to work with. How do we divvy them up? What do we start with? Okay. Connect them all. How many did I use? So 24 electrons left. Where are they going to go? How, I guess we, we still need to fill all the valences. Does carbon have a full valence at this point? It's carbon set. That's convenient. How many does each of the, each of the halogens still needs? Six, right? Six times four is 24. How convenient. That's why we start at the outside and work our way in, because a lot of times it takes care of itself. Again, when you're doing this on your own paper, you don't need to put the little loops. They help me keep track, especially for the recording on the whiteboard and just so that those of you in the back can, can see them. Really easy to lose these little tiny dots if you don't do that. All right, so we have 
two different types of bonds here, right? We have covalent bonds, more or less. We'll talk about that scale here in a second. But we have carbon to chlorine bonds, and then we also have carbon to fluorine bonds. Do the fluorines and the, car and the chlorines have any bonds between each other? No, not the way it's drawn here, right? Um, this actually keeps all of our formal charges at zero. That's one of the ways we know this is a pretty good way to do that. Um, one of the reasons, another reason that we can we can say um, that we know carbon has to go in the middle. If we swapped carbon and chlorine, things would have very different Lewis dot structure or very different formal charges, right? All right, so let's talk about polar bonds. So I, I keep hinting at, okay, well, bonds aren't either covalent or ionic. They're really kind of both. It's a sliding scale. It's a spectrum more than it is a binary distinction between A and B. Really, it has to do with how well things share electrons, which has a lot to do with electronegativity, right? That's basically our, our scale for determining how well things share. So we have um, an additional way to categorize bonds based on the difference in electronegativity. If, and when, when I say classifying the bonds, I mean every individual what, um, combination of elements that has its own bond, we're gonna look at those bonds individually. We just look, and all we do is we just compare our electronegativity values. That's why this chart is on your periodic table. So you can look at it and say, okay, well, carbon to chlorine has a, a specific difference in electronegativity. For, for carbon to chlorine, chlorine holds onto the electrons better than carbon does because chlorine is more electronegative. Thomas's class. All right, thanks very much. Um, so when we're looking at these, we wanna know whether or not something is a, a true covalent bond or a polar covalent bond or an ionic bond. All we do is we look at the two elements that are part of the bond. All right, and so in this case, if we're looking at chlorine and carbon, we can say, okay, chlorine's got an electronegativity value of 3.16. Carbon's is 2.55. That difference in electronegativity is what, 0.61? That tells us what class of bond we have. All right, so, Anytime you've got our three distinctions, three categories that we look at, are if it's between zero and 0 0.4, that, and when I say it, when the difference in electronegativity is between zero and 0 0.4, we call that a pure covalent bond or a nonpolar bond. If the difference is between 0 0.4 and 1.8 or 2.0, some different textbooks make this cut off at a different spot. Um, but they're basically, um, if it's in this region, it's still a covalent bond, but it's a polar covalent bond. And if the difference in electronegativity is greater than 1.8, it's an ionic bond. And even these is, it's not, this is breaking it up into three categories, but even these are not perfect. Because you can, not all polar covalent bonds are the, are the same. When I say that they're polar bonds, what that means is even though we're saying these electrons are being shared between the chlorine and the carbon, 
fluorine is more electronegative, meaning it's better at holding on to the electrons. So yeah, they're sharing these electrons, but they're not sharing them evenly. So to go back to the electronegativity as, as bullying, um, this is like sharing with your big brother or big sister. You're sharing, but you're not really sharing equally, right? The big brother or big sister is has control of the situation and the little brother or sister is just along for the ride. Carbon, the lower electronegativity values is the little sibling. More electronegative means more electron density, more of the electrons around the chlorine. And so you wind up with these bonds that have that are partly negative on one side. It's not a full negative charge. Um, so we actually indicate that with a little symbol, it's a lowercase delta. We'd say that the chlorine side of this bond is partially negative and the carbon is partially positive. They both have full valences. They're both stable but they're not being shared equally. And so that means that this chlorine behaves like it's got a slight, it's going to be attracted to positive charges because this, of this polar covalent bond. And so, and we always come back to this scale. Zero to 0 0.4 is polar covalent. And that's, it seems like a somewhat an arbitrary cutoff. Um, the way I always remember what that number is, is that basically the cutoff is the bond is a bond between carbon and hydrogen. A bond between carbon and hydrogen is a nonpolar bond because if you have a compound made entirely of carbon and hydrogen, it won't dissolve in water. Nonpolar compounds won't dissolve in water well. And so carbon and hydrogen must be a nonpolar bond. So Hydrocarbons, stuff like butter, gasoline, oil, anything that doesn't mix with water well is mostly hydrogen and carbon, right? And so that's sort of our dividing line. Anything that's more, a bigger difference in electronegativity than carbon and chlorine is a polar bond. And anything that's, that is the same or less is a nonpolar bond. So what's our difference in electronegativity for carbon to fluorine? Well, 2.55 still, right? So what's fluorine? 3.98. So fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine, right? So we've got an even more polar bond. That's all, that's what? point. Three seven is that right? Four three. Four three. Not quite up to that 1.8 line, so it's not a it's not an ionic bond, but it's a really polar bond. You've got even more of a partial negative on the fluorine than you did on the chlorine. All right, we'll come back to to the effects of that in a minute. Um, but we want to be thinking about these bonds that we're drawing in terms of they're not just ionic or covalent. There's also this whole other category of polar covalent. All right, let's... Move along here. Let's talk a little bit more about these covalent compounds because it turns out covalent compounds um, and, and ionic compounds, they can get a little bit more complicated than just looking at their formulas. Formulas are a pretty good way. They're a pretty good start to figuring out how things are set up. Um, but there's a little bit more to it than that. As usual with chemistry, as soon as we get comfortable with an idea, we're going to take it and blow it up and expand it. And it's like, okay, well, now we're going to 
add more details to, so that we can get more accurate. It's not just, let me go back. I always do this, huh? Erase something and then immediately redraw it. Is this the same compound? As this? I drew it this way before. It's the same formula. Is it the same compound though? Why? The electrons are distributed the same way. We have the same types of bonds. And this is really gets into some OCHEM ideas. Uh, you can have the exact same bonds arranged differently in space and it's a different compound. But it turns out these actually are the same they are arranged the same way in space once we start looking at the shapes of the molecules, not just looking at um, how we would distribute the electrons. If we actually want to look at the shapes of these molecules, we need to get a little bit more um, in depth. Right? And so uh, we're going to skip that concept for now. But here's Here's the basics of, of what I'm talking about. If you look at this, this molecule on the left, it's a much larger molecule than what we've been dealing with here. But we can see, okay, it's basically just a whole bunch of carbons where every carbon has four bonds, it has a full valence. And the oxygens don't have lone pairs drawn, but they each have two bonds. One, one oxygen bond to a carbon, one oxygen bond to a hydrogen. Um, When we start looking at these larger molecules, a lot of times drawing them in 2D doesn't accurately show what's going on because that doesn't really look the same as that. But it's the same molecule, just two different ways of representing it. We're trying to show these three-dimensional objects on a flat screen. We're going to have to have some give and take. There's different ways we can do it. Um, And when we get to these larger molecules as well, a lot of times their molecular formulas, the formula per molecule is a little bit different. And this is one of the reasons why we don't always, with covalent compounds especially, we don't always reduce all of those fractions. So remember for ionic compounds, our formula we said was the lowest whole number ratio of ions, right? That makes them add up to zero. For, I, for a covalent compounds, that's not always the case. How many carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens do we have in the molecule on the left? Well, in any of them, but you can't really count them for the other ones. How many carbons do we have? Double check. I think it should be six. So the, the molecular formula here is C6. How many oxygens? No. It's all carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. Should also be six oxygens. How many hydrogens? Can anybody count? How many? Does anybody recognize that formula from anything? It's glucose. Turns out it's also fructose. It's the same formula. It's also a lot of artificial sweeteners have the same formula. Most carbohydrates have that same ratio of, of uh, atoms to each other. Um, galactose is the other one, the other simple sugar that's present in our diet a lot. Um, they all, glucose, galactose, galactose, and fructose are all C6H12O6. What do we get if we actually reduce that to the lowest whole number ratio? That's a different compound. We actually did that as a practice the other day for our Lewis dot structures, right? We drew this. Does anybody know what this molecule is? Anybody done any dissections? This is formaldehyde. Decidedly not glucose. Um, I don't know if you've ever smelled 
formaldehyde, but it does not smell like something that you'd want to ingest. Whereas glucose is glucose. Glucose is sugar. It's delicious. So with these molecular formulas and molecular models, we can actually expand a whole lot for these covalent compounds beyond just what's our lowest whole number ratio. And a lot of times for carbohydrates in general, by in including simple sugars and what they call sugar alcohols, which are a lot of those artificial sweeteners that you find in, in zero carb um, drinks that still have some calories in them, like the, the blue monster energy drinks. Um, those all follow the same general formula, which we can represent algebraically by just saying CnH2nON. All carbohydrates basically have the same formula that way. Um, you just plug in a different number for N depending on what the molecule is. Sometimes like ribose, the, the sugar that holds DNA molecules together is C5H10O5. But most of the sugars in our diets are C6H12O6. Um, all of this just to go, uh, to get into why, why do we care what the molecular formula is versus the what's known as the empirical formula, which is that lowest whole number ratio um, of, the, of the elements. So for ionic compounds, we just do the empirical formula. And that's pretty good for the most part. Um, there are some cases in geology where the empirical formula is not the best way to describe a particular L, um, mineral or something like that. But for the most part, ionic compounds, we're just going to use the lowest whole number ratio. But the molecular formula gives us the total number of atoms in a molecule. Because that lowest whole number ratio might not tell us the whole story. Right. I believe the last page on the nomenclature packet had some of these practice problems, right? They said, what's the empirical formula? What's, what's the molecular formula? This is why that matters. Because it's not always as simple as lowest whole number ratio of atoms. And when we do blow up the structure and draw it this way, we call this the structural formula. So there's the molecular formula which would be this. For glucose, the molecular formula is six C6H12O6. The empirical formula is the actual redu reduced ratio. Does anybody know what empirical means? It does not mean the same thing as imperial. So imperial units are not empirical. Empirical just means determined by experiment. So it means that we don't necessarily have a reason for it. It just means it's something we've tested. So like the acceleration due to gravity on earth. So who's taking physics in here? What is that number? Uh, 9.81 meters per second squared. That's an empirical number. It's not coming from theory, it's just measured. So the empirical formula of a compound or of an ionic, ionic or, um, or covalent is just like, okay, if we took it and we reduced it to atoms, how many of each atom, what's the ratio, the lowest whole number ratio? When we actually have them all connected properly, that gives us the molecular formula. And if we write it out in a way that actually shows us what the Lewis dot structure looks like, that's what we call the structural formula. And that's like what's drawn on the left up there. Or the, when we talked about acetate, I said, oh, organic chemists might write acetate like this. That's showing more the structural formula to it, right? Because that's showing you how all the atoms are connected, not just that there's two carbons, there's a carbon with three hydrogens connected to a carbon that has two oxygens, right? So 
there's, as always, there's different layers of complexity depending on what we're trying to talk about at any given point. Some cases, the molecular formula is good enough. And we don't really care about the structural formula. Some cases, we really want to know the structural formula, especially when you get to OCHEM. In some cases, the empirical formula is good enough if we're trying to figure out certain properties, especially for ionic compounds. All right, we've talked about covalent bonds. Thought I pulled these out. We talked about formal charge. Let's do a practice for these. What's that molecule on the left? ClO3 with a negative. Four A. The fact that it has a negative sign means it's not chlorine trioxide. It's chlorate because it has the negative sign. What's the Lewis dot structure going to look like for chlorate? First off, how do we know what goes in the middle? Mm. That's kind of a tricky one, right? We have three oxygens, one chlorine. That's a pretty good hint that maybe chlorine goes in the middle, but we would want it to know for sure. Normally we would say, well, it's something that has the lowest, the lowest number of, or the greatest number of vacancies would go in the middle, right? But that'd be oxygen. So our more foolproof way of thinking about it is electronegativity. We look at the electronegativity of, of chlorine versus oxygen. Chlorine, even though it only needs to gain one electron to get to, to a full valence, it has a lower electronegativity than oxygen. So if you put chlorine with oxygen, the chlorine is going to share more than it wants to. So the chlorine is going to go in the middle. And we're going to put oxygens around it, three of them, right? How many valence electrons do we have to work with for chlorate? Well, three oxygens. Each oxygen has six valence electrons plus one chlorine that brings seven valence electrons. Is that it? Why not? Because we have a charge. We have a negative one charge. So what does that do to our total number of electrons. We get one extra electron. So 18 plus 7 is 25, 26 electrons. So just like with electron configuration, a charge doesn't throw all the rules out the window. We just add, we just adjust the number we normally would get based on the charge. If it was a positive charge, we'd be missing an electron. It was a minus three, we'd have three extra electrons, right? Easy enough. We're good at counting electrons by now, right? There goes six. Yeah. 20 electrons left. How many do we need to use for the oxygens to fill up all the valences for the oxygens? Another 18. And once again, how convenient. Chlorine needs to gain two more electrons, right? Boom, we use the right number of electrons. Everything has a full valence. Does that keep our formal charge as low as possible? It's not something we're used to seeing, chlorine having that many bonds, right? What's the formal charge on the chlorine? Plus two, right? It owns five electrons and it has seven on the periodic table, right? Because remember all of these bonds are shared. Even though they're not shared evenly, like we just learned, they're still shared. So for the purposes of formal charge, 
we treat them like they're shared evenly. So five electrons and yeah, seven electrons on the periodic table. So that gives us an overall plus two charge. What's the formal charge on each of the oxygens? They own seven. How many do they have on the periodic table? Six. So each of them is a minus one. And there's three of them. Does that make sense? Is that as close to zero as we can get? Did we do that right? Here's the other way you know if you did formal charge right. If you did formal charge right, the sum of all of the formal charges has to add up to the overall charge of the molecule. This was chlorate, right? So it had a negative one charge. So when we sum all these up, it should be minus one. Minus three, plus two, minus one. We're good there. Is this the best possible Lewis dot structure? Um, now we're gonna we're gonna introduce a new concept for Lewis dot structures. And that's the idea that some elements can have more than eight electrons. Everything besides hydrogen and helium needs to have at least eight electrons to be stable. If it's in the third row of the periodic table, what happens in the third row of the periodic table? Maybe not third row of the periodic table, rephrase. What happens in the third energy level of an atom? More electrons, why? We introduce the D block. That first d orbital, even though chlorine doesn't have any electrons in the in the 3D, it has an empty d orbital sitting there, right? So anything in the third row of the periodic table and down can actually go more than eight electrons in its valence if it allows you to get your formal charges closer to zero. Second row of the periodic table, well, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon can never have more than eight electrons in their valence. They're limited to only n equals two. So they only have an s orbital and a p orbital to work with. But the third row and the fourth row, now we have these other orbitals that are empty sitting around that we can use to go past eight electrons if we need to. These oxygens have a negative one formal charge because they're, they own seven electrons and they have six on the periodic table. What would get them cl closer to zero if they shared more, right? They have extra electrons. That's why it's a negative charge. And the chlorine, on the other hand, has a plus two. So chlorine needs to gain some more electrons. The oxygens all have too many electrons. What's the formal charge on this oxygen now? It has, it owns six and it has six on the periodic table, right? That gives it a formal charge of zero. This one's still minus one. What's the formal charge on chlorine now? Now it has, it has more than eight electrons, so it makes it look weird, but follow our regular rules. Each of these bonds, it owns half of, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six. And it had seven on the periodic table, right? So it just went from a plus two to a plus one. Remember, for our formal charges, the way we use those is closer to zero is more stable. We just made it more stable by making the oxygen sh share more. And because it's chlorine in the middle, we can break that octet rule and do that. Could we improve it again? How? 
do the same thing to another oxygen, either of the other oxygens. When we get to talking about these, these um, molecular structures, the geometries, turns out this will arrange itself so it's symmetrical regardless of how we draw it. So now we've got another oxygen that's zero. What's the formal charge on chlorine now? It has seven that it owns, and it has seven on the periodic table. This is a better Lewis dot structure. The first Lewis dot structure satisfied our first two criteria, which is use the right number of electrons and make sure everything has a full valence, right? This one's an even better Lewis dot structure because this satisfies the third criteria, which is keep the formal charge as close to zero as possible. We can't make the formal charge zero on everything. Why not? Because the compound has a charge. Something has to have a charge if the compound has to has a charge, right? Um, is there a limit to how many valence electrons can have in? Basically the d orbital. The d orbital is the limit. So in theory, you could get up to 18 valence electrons. It realistically, you won't wind up actually ever seeing that um, in a Lewis dot structure because once you get past a certain level, you don't have room physically to fit more electrons, even though the d orbital has space for them. Energetically, spatially, there's no room. So really, um, 12, maybe 14 is about as many as you, you will realistically see uh, around a, a central atom. Which this and this is sitting at twelve, right? This is about as mo as many as you will see normally. And in order for that to happen, what kind of atom do we need in the middle? What let us do that? Why were we able to break the d block? Or I just gave the answer because the d block, right? So we need to be in the third row of the periodic table or lower for this to happen. You will never see this happen with nitrogen. Okay? Because sulfur does. So that's why sulfate has a different formula than nitrate. Nitrate's Paul, um, Lewis dot structure doesn't look the same as sulfates, even though they're in the same row of the or same column of the periodic table. No, they're not, huh? Never mind. Um, phosphates, phosphate versus nitrate have very different formulas and charges because phosphorus has a D block, so it can break that octet rule, but nitrate can't. For practice, let's do the, the Lewis dot structures for both of those. You're still limited spatially. Um, Yes, in theory, if you're in the F block, you can get a whole bunch of valence electrons, especially if you kick out your 6S electrons. So something like mercury 2 plus, in theory, has a whole bunch of valence electrons at probably 30, I think it's 34 valence electrons once it loses those two electrons from the 6S. Um, but that doesn't mean that you'll be able to see them in a Lewis dot structure, though. No. For, because of the spatial reasons. What's the Lewis dot structure for nitrate going to look like? How many valence electrons do we have? You've got a nitrogen plus three oxygens plus one electron because of the charge. It's 24, right? 18 and six, yeah. Now we're down to 18 electrons left. And each oxygen needs six more, right? So if we fill up all the oxygens, we've run out of electrons. We've used our right number of electrons. 
So what do we do when we haven't filled the valence of the nitrogen in the middle, but we've run out of electrons? We do what? Make oxygen share some more. We can't just throw the bond in there without also erasing one of those lone pairs though, because what's rule number one? Use the right number of electrons. If we just threw another bond in there and we forgot to erase our lone pair, we don't have the right number of electrons now, right? We added extra electrons that we didn't count up here. So this is as good as nitrate can get for its Lewis dot structure. It's not perfect as far as charges go. So right, because what's the formal charge on that nitrogen? It has four electrons that it owns and it has five on the periodic table, right? So that gives it a plus one charge. And then we have two oxygens that are each negative one. And one oxygen that's a zero. So at the very least they add up to negative one like they're supposed to. But if this was a sulfur, we'd be able to make one of the oxygens share more, right? Or a phosphorus for that matter. We'd be able to make one of the oxygens share some more so we could get that plus one charge on the nitrogen to zero. We're not allowed to do that because it's nitrogen, because it's in the second row of the periodic table. Nothing in the second row of the periodic table will ever have more than eight valence electrons. But let's do phosphorus now. How many valence electrons do we have to work with for phosphorus? Got five from the phosphorus plus four times six plus an extra three for the charge. So four times six is 24, right? Yeah, 24, second guessing myself again. 29, 32. Phosphorus is less electronegative than oxygen, so phosphorus goes in the middle. Surround it with oxygens. And go ahead and connect them. 24 electrons left. How many does each oxygen still need? Another six, six times four is 24. So we're gonna use up all of our remaining electrons done satisfied criteria one we use the right number of electrons right Criteria two is good. We filled all the valences. What are the formal charges? All the oxygens are identical, so we only have to do that one once, right? What's the formal charge on all the oxygens right now? They own seven, so the formal charge is minus one. What's the formal charge on the phosphorus? Plus one. Can we get that to be better? By doing what? Adding a bond. Make one of the oxygens share more than it wants to. Now we've got one oxygen that's a zero. And now the phosphorus owns five electrons and it has five on the, on the periodic table. This is a better Lewis dot structure. The other one was okay. 
this is a better Lewis dot structure. On the midterm, if you got to, if I said draw the best possible Lewis dot structure and you stopped here, that's three out of four. That's most of the credit, but it's not the best possible structure because we can get those formal charges closer to zero. By doing that. Interestingly enough, the formal charges, getting formal charges closer to zero and the electronegativity values is how we can actually make some of the noble gases start to participate and make compounds. Because it turns out if you take xenon and you expose it to fluorine gas, you make a covalent compound, which is really weird. They weren't expecting that. It was a totally random event that led to that. Um, one of a, um, a researcher in the, I wouldn't say in the 50s, but maybe it was the 60s, that worked a lot with fluorine. One of his grad students as a, as a uh, gift trapped fluorine gas inside of a, a glass bubble um, that was also filled with some xenon because xenon's inert, it's a noble gas. It doesn't do anything, right? So they were just like, oh, this is cool. You work with fluorine gas all the time. We'll put some fluorine in a bubble for you and you can keep it on your desk. Um, and after, after a couple of years, um, the, uh, the researcher noticed that there was this, these white crystals that started forming inside the glass bubble but that shouldn't be possible because nothing reacts with xenon and all that was in the bubble was xenon and fluorine. And so they were able to figure out that it was this compound and they were able to work out why it's because you can actually draw a Lewis dot structure here. Xenon is not on our list of electronegativities, but fluorine is the most electronegative element that there is. So basically, if you put a whole bunch of fluorines around a noble gas, the fluorines are so electronegative, they can even make the noble gas share. And so we can actually draw a Lewis dot structure for this. The Lewis dot structure is just going to look like Count up all the valence electrons we have to work with. It's eight valence electrons from the xenon plus four times seven. So that's 28, 20, so a total of 36 electrons. 32 of which are used once I finish drawing these. There's still two more pairs of electrons though, right? So they have to go somewhere and they can't go on the fluorine because fluorine's in the second row of the periodic table, right? That looks like a mess. That looks also like it's breaking any number of rules because it's got xenon in the middle and it's got more than eight valence electrons. But what's the formal charge on all the fluorines? Zero on all the fluorines. Because they own seven electrons and they have seven on the periodic table. How many electrons does xenon own? One, two, three, four from the bonds plus four as lone pairs eight valence electrons and it had eight on the periodic table, right? So everything has a formal charge of zero, which tells us it's actually relatively stable. This is a compound that really exists even though it's a noble gas because, and we can explain why by looking at formal charge and things with d orbitals get to break the octet rule if they want, if it's, if they want, if it's more stable to do so. All right, I know we have, we have 10 minutes left, but I wanna leave you with one concept.
to think about, and then we'll pick this back up on Monday. And this is, I alluded to it a few times in here, somebody else asked me about it um, already. What happens with these electron clouds? Well, and here's the really the key concepts that lead to this. We can tell something about the shape of the molecule if we remember that almost all of the volume is the electrons. Remember how tiny the nucleus is? It's the baseball in the middle of the, the stadium. Electrons are all negatively charged, which means they're all going to push each other away. This is just the, the theoretical physicist's way of showing of saying um, electrons push away other electrons. It's called a Feynman diagram. What that means is that when we have these structures, when we have these covalent compounds, all of these bonds and lone pairs will try to push each other away as much as possible. When you have these covalent bonds, you're stuck with these electrons between boron and fluorine. They have to be between these two elements, right? We're not free to just move the electrons anywhere that we want, but they are allowed to sort of push away and try and stay away from the other bonds. because The other bonds are also made out of electrons. And these electrons will push each other away. And that means that all the shapes of these molecules are all dictated by Geometry. All we have to remember is the electrons push away other electrons. And that concept is abbreviated BSEPR or Vesper or valence shell electron pair repulsion. Um, it doesn't look like it if you sound it out, but that acronym, we pronounce it VESPER because it's easier to say VESPER than VESEPER. Um, so VESPER geometries just means, okay, we're going to take these things that are taking up space around a central atom, and we're going to rearrange them so that they can be as far apart as possible. And it's not really something that we have to do. It happens naturally. These electrons will always move on their own to be as far away from each other as possible. So what's the, the furthest apart they can be if it's two pairs, what we call electron clouds or electron domains. we usually rank how far apart they could be in terms of angles, because like I said, we're not allowed to just move them away from each other and have a physical distance. They still have to be around the same atom. So we rank it in terms of, of angles. So the furthest apart you can have two objects and still have them attached to the same central atom, it's 180 degrees. We have 360 degrees to work with. So halfway around exactly opposite is 180 degrees, right? What's the furthest apart we could have three objects? 120. What's the furthest apart we could have four objects? Almost. If we were stuck in two dimensions, you'd be right except that we don't have two-dimensional objects. These molecules are three-dimensional objects, right? So when we have four electron domains, we actually have a shape that's called a tetrahedron. Oh, it is 35. All right, so think in 3D. That's my point there. Quiz this weekend will be a little bit of nomenclature and some practice with Lewis dot structures. Yeah, Mia. It is Friday, right? Yeah. Okay. I just panicked for a second. Yeah.